Hi, good morning, guys. Okay, it's about 11.15 now. I think we can start. For today, we're going to do a sector report on the Singapore property developers. So I'm Te Hong here. I will start off with the state of the public housing in Singapore before Peter will go on to talk about the private property sector in Singapore. So let me start off first with um, the public housing sector. I will talk about HGBs and executive condominiums. So to start off, I will talk about the state of the HGBs in Singapore. For those of you tuning in, for those people who, who got married uh, in the two, early, 2000s, uh, early 2010s, that period of time, 2010, 2011, those of you who have friends who applied for HDBs then, you, you probably wouldn't be too, uh, too unfamiliar with the state of the HDB affairs then. So that time, the last elections we had was in, the two elections before we had was in 2011. Before that, there was a big hoo-ha on the ground, a lot of grouses, a lot of frustration on the ground on the state of public housing in Singapore, especially for the new couples who tried to get HDBs, a lot of frustration about them not having, not getting queue numbers despite having applied for multiple times. And there was another problem with the high COVs paid over the resale HDBs as well. So a lot of this frustration on the ground at that time came from the fact, if you look at this graph, you will not find it hard to figure out why. Look at 2006 to 2010, the average yearly supply of HDBs during that five-year period. On average, a year, you get only about 6,000 units of HDB supplied for that five-year period. So you look at the purple line here, which is the average yearly demand that is um, derived from the total bookings in the, any particular year. So you see that in that five-year period, the amount of HDB supplied grossly is way under what was, um, what was uh, required by the market. And then after that, the, the government re realized it and then they ramped up supply and which is why you see in the last five years there was a big uptick in supply. And from 2015 to 18 onwards, forecasted supply will be about 30,000 units every year. So we, we take a look at, for, for rough gauge of how much demand would be on average per year, we take a look at the total number of marriages in a year. Because uh, the, new, the, the newlyweds are likely to be the biggest demand generator for new HDBs. And as we know in Singapore, 80% of our population live in HDBs. So if you take that proportion and you, trans you, you put it on the total marriages in a year, 28,000 times about 80% you get, you should have roughly about slightly more than 20,000 of demand for this kind of units in a year. So with what we said about the uh, yearly supply going forward from 2015 to 18 of uh, 28,000, we figure that supply should be sufficient to meet demand going forward. And next we talk about executive condominiums. This is a scheme which was phased out in 2008 in favor of the DBSS scheme. But in 2010, the government reintroduced it. And you see that from 2011 and to 2015, Supply has been pretty volatile, but in the last two years, 2014 and 15, you see that supply was actually more than what was sold on the ground. So the excess supply over demand has led to this uh, phenomenon of occupancy rate dropping to 86% as of the second quarter this year. So at a, at that point in time, we have about close to 3,000 units unsold and unoccupied and this number is actually a high since 2010 but we think that although this number seems high it's a high over the past five years there are a few mitigating factors which can potentially help developers um, buffer the situation on the ground firstly if you look at the ABSD timeline for 
private property developers who have ECs on their books. Bellwoods and Bellwaters, they are the most likely first developments to, to suffer from ABSD charges for the developers because most of the developments before Bellwoods, they are actually pretty much majority sold. So we look at Bellwoods onwards and the first time frame where ABSD charges will kick in is actually 2Q of 2018. And if you look at the first few bars here, most of the developments are actually pretty much mostly sold. You look at Bellwaters, Amore, Lake Life, close to 100% sold. And from now until 2018, we have a close to two years period for developers to sell. So because of this, we do not anticipate that uh, developers will have problems clearing the inventory of their books and very, very little likelihood of them needing to incur ABSD charges because of any unsold inventory. And another mitigating factor is the upcoming supply from now until at least the first quarter of 2018. What we have now remaining in terms of the plots of land which are designated for EC purposes, we only have three plots of land which are yet to be launched. So the blue bars that you've seen in the earlier slides, those are the existing supply plus upcoming supply we only have three more plots of land. These three plots of land would likely add about uh, 1,500 units to the total supply. So this 1,500, in, including this 1,500, you add it to what we talked about just now, current, unsold, and unoccupied supply, which is about 2,900, plus 1,005, you have about 4,000 odd units from now until about first half 2018. And it could be even longer, depending on the the progression of the land sales that the government pushes out for EC purposes. So, but for now, until for now, from now until 2018, first quarter or second quarter at least, our supply is limited to this current 4,000 plus units. This is about 1.5 times the average annual demand since 2010. So, I think this is a pretty decent manageable figure for developers, the time frame they have to clear inventory is very, very manageable. And then a second point that will allow developers to buffer the situation is that starting from third quarter of 2015, we actually saw an increase of the household salary ceiling from 12,000 to 14,000. So the impact of that rise in the ceiling. We saw it in first half 16. We saw a total of 1,841 units sold in just that six months alone and that number is already 72% of the full year 2015 figure. So the more recent launches we look at the starting from Signature at Yishun all the way to North Wave. These are the launches from September last year until now. Some of, some of them, very location-based, have done very well, like Wonderville, Treasure, Qu Treasure Crest have done very well. But the, the thing to note about launches, all these launches, is that even though they may look like they have only sold 17%, let's say, for example, Park Life or North Wave only 14%, but the thing to note about this is that the launch date versus the deadline for the ABSZ will be a big there will be a big gap in that when developers get a plot of land, usually the time frame for them is they will start to do all the planning. Within a one and a half year period, they will launch it. So from the time they get the land, one and a half years later they launch it. Five years from the time they get the land, they have to finish selling. Which means to say from the time they launch to the time they have to sell, there will be another three and a, three and a half years gap. So the launches were, the earlier, earliest launch was in September 2015. You have another three and a half years to sell, typically. So I think this coupled with the limited upcoming supply until 2018 would translate to mean that it 
all points to a very manageable scenario for developers who carry ECs on their books. Okay, our next person to Peter to talk about private property. Hi, morning everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Peter here. So let's change the channel a bit and go to the private property segment. Now, uh, before we go into the repo as a whole, let me just remind everyone, or uh, for the benefit of those who may not be following the property segment, let's try to understand uh, some of the terms. For example, where are the different market segments? When we talk about core central region, uh, rest of central region, outside central region, where are they exactly and what do they really mean? Followed by we are looking into the, uh, the, the, the different cooling measures that are in place. So please bear with me for a while. Um, okay, for let's start off with the map location of the different market segments. So in Singapore, we have uh, uh, three market segments, namely uh, the core central region, rest of central region, out, outside of central region with uh, with the acronym CCR, RCR, and OCR. So of course, um, the uh, or put it or put this way, the CCR segment uh, is the is uh, are the locations which commands a location premium or essentially they are the, uh, the, the, the prime areas. So slightly outside of which there's the RCR segment or what it means is the rest of central region and these districts are like uh, Queenstown, Marine Parade, so on and so forth and outside of this uh, which is the, the, the area in white are the, uh, 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 the area which is outside of central region so essentially uh, some of the other districts, uh, like for example, Sengkang and Pongo, uh, just naming a few, these will fall in the, the OCR segment. So next, probably you'll be, you have heard about the cooling measures in place, but what are they exactly? And let me just do a quick recap, and this is a, a property cooling measure calendar that we have uh, actually compiled. So ever since 2010, the beginning of 2010, all the way to uh, December 2013, there were essentially nine large adjustments or introduction of property cooling measures. So while this may look like a very overwhelming chart here, but uh, the thing to uh, really pay attention to are uh, two of which. First is the uh, additional bias stamp duty or ABSD in short. Probably have heard of this. And next thing is the, uh, the total debt servicing ratio. So let's start with ABSD. Now, um, ABSD was first introduced in 2011, but it was adjusted in January 2013. Okay, so how it works is that um, when a Singaporean first buys buys a property, uh, the first property has no levy at all, no ABSD. It's only when the second and third property uh, uh, come in place, or uh, when they start purchasing their second and third properties. So the second property will start levying 7% and 10%. What it means is that, say right now, uh, you just go on the street, buy a property offhand, say for example a second property uh, for a Singapore citizen. Um, let's take some price of say for example a million dollars. 7% means it's $70,000 in cash which cannot be financed. It has to be come out in cash. And um, that that amount, uh, first thing first is, and uh, it, it does not add to the, the, the value of the property. And next thing is it has to be financed with cash which is quite a hefty amount. And this make it worse when it comes to uh, PR and foreigners, especially foreigners. First property they buy is 15%. Again, you use the same example, a million dollar property. A foreigner will have to shell out $150,000 just for $1 million in property, uh, $1 million property. So um, this is the first cooling measure we had a, a, a binding constraint in the property market, followed by the next introduction of the uh, total debt servicing ratio, TDSR. So what this does is, uh, what it means is that a home buyer cannot finance more than 60% uh, of, of their mortgage or 60% of their gross monthly income. Cannot, I mean, uh, when they service, sorry, let me just say that, say that again. So uh, when it comes to servicing their, their home loans, they, the home loan installment portion cannot exceed 60% of their gross monthly income. 
So again, um, some people who aren't able to uh, afford, say for example, if income it's uh, it's within a certain range, they are driven. They are they, they are essentially driven out of the market if they are looking to buy a a more expensive property. So we'll explore more into this uh, in the in the in the, in the further slides. Now, uh, now we jump into the the developer's perspective. Again, you probably heard of this QC and uh, next is ABSD doesn't only apply to home buyers, it also applies to developers. Now, what is the difference between these two? Okay, so QC, uh, what it means is a developer has to obtain TOP uh, within five years from a land purchase date. And again, they also they are given another two years upon TOP uh, to sell these units. Failing to do so, uh, they have to apply for this thing called the uh, uh, QC extension charge or qualifying certificate uh, or in short QC extension charge and how it works is that first year the amount to, the amount payable is 8% based on the number of unsold units multiplied by land price and the second year will be double the amount third year it will be, 20, it will be, uh, it will be triple the amount from the first year and it will be kept at 24% uh, of, of land cost uh, and uh, I mean like uh, from third year onwards. So fourth year onwards and things like that used to be 24%. Now, uh, on the ABSD portion, what is different here is, first thing first is timeline. Instead of giving, given seven years, I mean uh, compared to QC, QC is five years to develop, sorry, five years to develop, two years to sell. But for ABSD, both selling and construction has to be completed within five years from, again, land purchase date. And the amount, is different as well. Uh, it's 15% on land cost plus 5% interest per annum uh, upon the uh, the incurrence of, uh, of of the ABSD. So again, the special thing to pay attention to is even if a development or a developer has one unit remaining to sell in the development, the developer will still incur the full ABSD amount. So, for example, let's say 15% of land cost on, uh, say for example, on a 50 million, 50 million, 100 million development project. So, even if one unit is left unsold, the developer have to come out with 15 million dollars. We'll, we'll have this amount uh, clawback. Now, uh, now we jump into the uh, our, uh, our report straight. So let me talk about the, the different uh, definitions and the, and, and the different uh, cooling measures, so on and so forth. Let's jump into the, the main content. So in the recent quarters, what happens is that uh, resource sales mainly, or not just say mainly, is essentially driven by just two segments, the RCR and OCR segment. So both of these segments between the past four quarters, so between third quarter of 2015 to the second quarter of 2016, just transactions between uh, these two segments made up 82% of total sales volume. And to break down even further, 46% uh, of total transactions were from properties of slightly lower sales value or essentially below a million dollars. Now, what to pay it, what is to uh, take note of is that we believe that this sales mix is most likely going to continue because of this uh, what we just mentioned about the 60% TDSR property cooling measure. So, um, having said that, we are not expecting any uh, any improvement um, uh, or any change in this sales mix. And why is this important to to be established? We, we, will, we will come to it later. Now, in the in the next slide, um, in terms of launches, developers have launched more than 75% of new units in the RCR and OCR segments. So for the past six quarters, most of these, or essentially close to 75% of new units are from just RCR and OCR segment. So notice that I haven't even talked about the, the CCR segment, or CCR segment is as good as being muted. That's because that uh, in the past three years, minus away July 2016, when Goko Land won a piece of land, uh, won the, the, the tender in a piece of land, for a piece of land in River Valley. So apart from these in July 2016, the last land transaction was in September 2013. And this was a three year time period, close to three years, around two years, 10 months. So let's just run it up, make it easy, three years. And what this means is that going forward, there will be a time period where there will be as good as no CCR launches. 
and this is something that uh, we will pay attention to. And uh, so now, on the developers, uh, uh, for developers, they are remaining cautious or adopting a, a, a cautious attitude when it comes to the, the CCR segment, simply because of there is an oversupply, the building up of units there. There's, uh, there is a stubborn inventory of CCR units that are, are that are still in the market or hard to sell. And just now in the previous slide, if you notice, when I talk about the new sales here, most of it are sold from the slightly lower value uh, uh, the, uh, properties. Essentially, when you go up, when, when you just look at the, the pie chart here, majority of it is formed by uh, property value that are below a million dollars. When it comes up the, the, the ladder, 1.5 million to 2 million, they, they become even more scarce. And more importantly, this is minored by the TDSR constraint. And CCR segment, uh, compared to the other two segments, are uh, a few properties that are of higher value. So to come back to it, we believe that as long as this 60% TDSR cooling measure uh, is in place, it will continue weighing on this uh, CCR segment. And the CCR segment, like I say again, uh, has higher prices. And recently, we're starting to see developers become more creative towards, uh, towards selling their properties. And we pull out two developments that are actually uh, intriguing, which are uh, Upmore 3 and OUE Twin Peaks. Both of these developments are in the CCR segment. And what they did is like this. So let me just uh, bring everyone's attention to, to this chart below here, the left chart. This is the transaction, uh, the, the, the transaction profile for, for Upmore 3. Now, for the full year of 2012, 2013, and 2015, just in one month alone uh, in May, or April and May during this period of time, that's when they started to rock uh, uh, this creative marketing scheme. In Armour 3, they rock this thing called ABSD absorption package. In short, it's just a, a, a discount. So they not only absorb ABSD, they also uh, give some uh, price discounts to, uh, to the development. And what happens next is that uh, you just have uh, more people coming to buy. So again, now what's even more interesting is these are development called OEV Twin Peaks. Again, it's a CCR uh, uh, development. Now, so the profile is rather similar as well. For the past six years, so between 2010 all the way to 2015, the amount of transactions uh, registered during this amount of time uh, probably just nice is able to match just one month of transaction in uh, May 2016. So what do they do? They did this thing, introduces this um, um, a deferred payment scheme option which allows a buyer to down pay 20%. So there's two packages or, or two schemes. One of it, the more popular one, was the, uh, the down paying of 20%. So it allows a buyer to, uh, to to um, down pay 20% first. And then what happens next is that a buyer will be able to occupy the, uh, the establishment because this, uh, this particular development has already TOP. So the building is ready and people can just uh, move in. And then again, now, the thing to consider is that, of course, things like that, it's just um, it's not sustainable as shown by the uh, the next few months of, of transactions. So immediately in June, it declined. In July, it declined again, and so on and so forth. So things like that, or transaction or sales volume, is not sustainable simply because um, we believe that it, we, we, we believe that um, you need more than just a, a creative marketing scheme in order to uh, you know to entice people to buy. At the end of the day, what is really required is a price reduction. And having talked about the 60% total debt servicing ratio, some people even you may be able to introduce, even developers can introduce the, the most creative of all marketing schemes. But if people are out of the market, if they can, simply cannot afford it, that is just there just isn't much alternatives. Now next. Um, we will go into the um, the inventory of, of developers. So inventory of uh, the, the build up of unsold units. So creating inventory uh, within the developers' books. So 
at this point of time, based on second quarter of 2016, there's a total of 13,000 units or so that are, that are unsold. And this is a multi-year high. And this presence of uh, stubborn inventory is likely to put a cap on the, uh, the price which a development can sell. So what this means, how this implicates the developer is of course the, the gross margin. They have to, when prices cannot increase, while at the same time uh, there are other costs, costs involved to, to holding these properties, uh, the developer's margin will be compressed. And then again, why is this important to consider is that this has some form of linkage towards um, uh, how, how the Singapore government will act. And again, while it may look like there's, um, there, there's so much woes on the street in the, in the property market, let's consider from the, uh, uh, from the policy making's point of view. At the end of the day, uh, right now, yes, correct, there is an oversupply of properties in the market right now. But consider from this one, if you look at the high here, you're looking at something like 17,000 units or so. So for the past five quarters or so, it's been gradually coming down. So even if they do not unwind cooling measures, properties are still selling. I.e., while well, it's not moving at fast pace, but it's gradually moving. And having said that, there is absolutely no incentive, at least at this point of time, not much incentive for the government to unwind cooling measures. And uh, speaking of which, In, in Singapore, historically, uh, Singaporeans took up a majority of new property unit sales and it even came out as high as 92%. So even if after the introduction of, uh, of uh, property cooling measures, this did not tilt the sales mix. So the dark blue bar here uh, represents the, uh, the proportion of, of new units that are sold to Singaporeans. So at the end of the day, what is important here to note is uh, it's the Singapore citizens which are driving transaction volumes in the property market. And the next thing to, to kind of, uh, that, that we have actually noticed is that uh, the high ownership rate in Singapore, we're standing right now around 90% or so, and it's been standing there uh, for, for a long time, for at least the, the past five to 10 years. And what does this suggest to us is that, uh, it suggests that with a high ownership rate, home buyers are, snapping up properties or homes for investments, regardless of whether it's for rental or price appreciation. And um, having said that, where, so between the three segments here, uh, the RCR properties or the RCR segment is offering the highest median gross yield. And how do we get this is, we use the median uh, rental per year divided by the, uh, the median prices. And what we get is, uh, of course, the, the RCR um, gross yield I just mentioned is around 3.7% or so. It's, it's significantly higher compared to uh, the, the core central region followed by the, the outside of central region. And this is mainly driven by two factors. First thing first is uh, there's higher rental there. And medium rental grew by close to 70% or so. And this is 10% higher than the other segments. While medium prices, on the other hand, uh, lag like behind the other two segments. Median prices in the RCR segment appreciated 50% and compared to 60% uh, in CCR and pales uh, to the OCR where uh, OCR segment grew uh, close to 90% or so. So there's at least a 40%, 40 percentage points higher than, uh, than, the, uh, than the RCR segment. Now, uh, since we're talking about rental, and right now at this point of time, the rental market is being pressured. And in fact, it has declined the most since the 2008 global financial crisis. And this decline was led mainly by higher vacancy rates. So if you look at the, the chart, let's bring everyone's attention to the bottom left chart. Vacancy rates in the global financial crisis, even at the high, was close to around 6% or so. Today, you're looking at something at like 9%, 50, a 50% increase between this point of time. And we're not expecting um, much improvement from there. I mean, uh, just considering from, uh, 
from some of the uh, the foreign labor policies has climbed down on it. And this is the first thing. This is the first factor. The second factor is that there will be more completions. So more completion of private properties means that uh, there will be more of these uh, properties out in the market which is available for rental. And judging from the existing market, it's really weak. And that's not only that. It's going to expand capacity. This just means that it's going to be more supply coming in and this will create even more pressures in the rental market. And in the next half of 2016, you're looking at something like 11,000 or so completions. 2017, 17,000. 2018, 15,000 or so. Add this up, you're looking at something like a close to 10% increase in the uh, in in total stock. And we think that uh, this is a, a significant amount of uh, of of new units coming in. And at the end of the day, what this means is that it's definitely not a landlord's market. Now. And just now we are talking about uh, uh, foreigners and about uh, uh, the driving demand and, 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 and so forth. So historically, there are three nationalities who are mainly uh, who made up the, uh, the form by foreign home buyers pool. And the top three nationalities are Malaysians, Indonesians, and, and Chinese. But if we just uh, bring everyone's attention again to this chart, so we took if someone were to buy a property in the first quarter of 2011, and we chose this point of time simply because that's when uh, most of the cooling measures were, were being uh, introduced at, uh, in, in, in this point of time. So now, if a Singaporean bought, uh, uh, I mean like uh, each of these nationalities, uh, citizens in this nationality have bought uh, properties within their home country, the only home buyer that is not making money uh, some is someone who is uh, who has bought a, a Singapore property. So uh, while this line appears flat, but it's actually a slight decline. It's actually at 99 percent. So it has stayed horizontal. But when compared to even the the, the slowest appreciation out of the uh, out of the other three uh, out of the other three markets, so Indonesia, it still grew at 30 or 40 percent for the past uh, four years or so, which is pretty decent returns. And of course, like uh, and this will pale in comparison when compared to a uh, China, while it may look like a roller coaster ride, but if someone has held a property up to today, they've made more than three times the amount. So, uh, if you look at this annual sales volume of, of uh, private residential properties broken down into uh, the foreigners and PRs, you can see that transaction volumes are, uh, are just dropping straight consecutively. So, in 2016, it's the lowest ever since. Um, which is close to the 2008 level. Now, we move on to land sales, and the lower number of uh, land sales right now, sorry, just give me a second. Okay, um, there are periods of, so what we've identified is that during periods of higher land sales, it's somehow translated into a, a decline in property prices. And let's pay attention to three points in time, 1996, 2007, and 2011. So the blue bars are uh, the number of land sales uh, transaction, and followed by the, 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 the orange line is the URA property price index. So during times when there were higher land sales, the highest land sales, so we get 1996. What follows next is a decline in property prices. And this was the same in 2007 and 2011 we stretch until today and we believe that why we observe such a phenomenon is that there is when there are larger land sales it means that there will be larger amount of, uh, of, of property units that will come into the market with a larger supply if demand is unable to keep up it just means that prices have to come down and now in 2016 the first half of 2016 government land sales transaction is close to a 12 year low since 2004. So in this year alone, you're looking at something like close to less than 20 transactions. And this low volume in land sales reflects weak sentiments among developers as they remain cautious uh, regardless of whether is it the, uh, uh, wrong or more importantly, uh, they, are, they are staying cautious uh, because of the, uh, the weak sentiments we're seeing not only in the, in the economy, as well as the, uh, the the slow absorption rate of the uh, unsold units.
So now, uh, the next thing that we have observed is that there's a strong correlation between a developer share price and sales volume. There are other factors to people might actually consider, like for example, earnings. It could be, uh, it could be among. I mean, uh, could be among these factors, the one which makes the most, uh, which makes the most sense, or at least in a data perspective, is uh, is sales volume. So sales volume at this point of time is close to a ten-year low, and if we just if we just if I just if I just look at this chart now, number of units, it's uh, it's it's close to uh, it's it's on a multi. Uh, I would say that it's uh, it's 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 close to a low, and it's very close to where uh, the next level of uh, if you're going to go down further, it's going to come down to where two thousand and eight. Uh, the amount of transactions which were registered in 2008, which was during the global financial crisis. So we don't see any major catalyst inside, apart from unwinding these existing property cooling measures. And on the property cooling measures, just now uh, we gave a snapshot of it. So what we have compiled is that home prices appreciated 70% in the past 10 years between 2006 and 2015, while which has only grown by 60% uh, or so. This number is actually, uh, home prices actually grow more than 70%, but we just use 70% and 60% to make the, the, comparison sim the comparison simple. Then again, uh, looking at this point of time, 70% and 60%, the contrast or the difference may not be that big. But let's not forget that property prices have already been uh, uh, has been coming down or been declining for the uh, for the past few quarters or so. It came down by around 10% or so. So looking at this perspective, even at 70% and 60%, there is still a mismatch between uh, the rate of home price growth and wage growth. And having said that, at least it is still premature for the Singapore government to unwind the property cooling measures. Now, I would just like to add on one thing here. So uh, let's consider another thing is, uh, while the developers are feeling the pressure, but at the end of the day, nobody, almost all stakeholders at this point of time are benefiting from the, uh, uh, from the in a way, yes, correct, in a way is, uh, uh, is benefiting the, 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 the people within the systems. So on the government's perspective, look at this. Just now we showed these unsold units. It's been gradually coming down. So even with the with, uh, the existing property cooling measures, units are still moving. And next, so units are still moving. Home ownership is still high. While property prices are coming down, uh, it's not a huge decline, like 20, 30 percent decline. But it's more like a soft landing in the property market in Singapore. In a way, the government is pretty comfortable. I would think that the government. I would like to think that. I mean, the opinion to say that uh, the government is in a very comfortable position because it suggests some form of equilibrium in the market. And having said that, again, just to substantiate my point, we think that it's just premature for the government to unwind uh, the existing property cooling measures. And finally, this is a table that we have compiled. There are the developments that are facing QC and uh, ABSD you can have a look at it. I mean, just in case you're hunting down for properties, this is a good list to start from. Now, uh, and finally, the last thing is that uh, this is the FTSE Real Estate Holdings and Development Index. And this is drawn on the minus one, minus two, plus one, and plus two standard deviations. At this point of time, developers are trading at uh, minus one, standard deviation. If you ask me, it's not, uh, yes correct, minus one standard deviation is, is low, but consider from this point of view, are we that far away from the global financial crisis? The dynamics in the property market, now at least in the private property market, suggests that we, the property market at this point of time, the health of it may not be that far away from it. Why am I saying that is, just now remember we talked about the, the vacancy rates. Vacancy rates in, uh, it's, it's really 50% higher. 
And not only that, when it comes to transaction for uh, for foreigners and PRs, it's also very close to where 2008 is. While people might say that we might still be a far cry uh, from from the global financial crisis, but are we really that far away from it? So this is a, a question that, uh, that that people should register as well. Now, this is a peer comparison table that we have compiled between the large developers and the, and the smaller developers. Price to book ratio right now on average is 0.7 and it's, it's a discount, it's a significant discount to book value but that is also because of the inherent risks that, that, are, that are present in the, in the property market. So uh, you can have a look at it. And with that, we have come to the end of our presentation. So uh, feel free to ask any questions you may have. Hi, um, good morning. Uh, this is Richard speaking. Uh, actually, there's a question here about the archive webinars. So actually, um, the link has changed. We announced that last week. So for those of you who were not um, present at last week's webinar, please look at the screen right now. This is the new uh, address for where all the um, webinars are. So. Uh, the old link doesn't work anymore. This is the new address. It's shown on the screen here, top left corner. So, um, yeah, please go to this new address if you uh, want to access the archived webinars and download the um, PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, this was changed last week. So, those of you who were not um, did not attend the webinar last week, you might not be aware of the new address. Anyway, the new address also has been featured in our last week's slide. So if you have last week's slide, you can click on it and it will uh, redirect you directly to the new location. I have a question on lower land sales and why is the uh, why, why is UHS or the price index still higher? Well, it takes a while to uh, for the um, lower land sales. Yes, correct. But it will take that there is a lag effect there, so it will take a few more quarters before you can actually uh, uh, at least a, a, a bit longer time before you can see. Uh, the, the this effect and also one thing to add on is that sales volume are actually still coming in rather strongly so if we have a look at a previous slide that we are in we notice that for the past four quarters uh, transactions have been coming in rather strong and these were mainly driven by the uh, the, the OCR development launches. So people are still coming into the market to buy. Essentially driven by like what I just mentioned, uh, properties that are uh, 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 they are priced uh, below the one million dollar mark. But going forward, 
as this inventory disappear or at least or at least a while more or in short it will just take a while more before we see the the, the effects in the market Okay, I got a question about uh, advice for investors in the property market. Well, unfortunately, uh, I'll say this way. Our job is to uh, is to mainly talk about the the developers, not about the underlying properties. But again, if you are to uh, if you are to consider from a develop developer's point of view, if you're standing on developer's perspective with this much of unsold units and sales volume have been gradually coming down it's not entirely the best time uh, to be looking at the uh, developer share but again just now as we mentioned about the the peer comparison table within the table you there are st there are some gems which are starting to show itself so um, we will be uh, we will be looking at some of the uh, some of these developers here. So uh, stay tuned with us. This is just a snapshot of the property market. Okay, uh, I got a question about developers are not building. So, uh, will this mean that we'll have a short supply in the future? Yes, yes, we believe so. And but then again, uh, you have a short supply. But let's not forget about the amount of unsold units. Again, I stress this again. The reason why they are not building in the first place is that there is just this amount of unsold units. Therefore, there are lesser land sales. And moving forward. We believe that this land sales transaction will only start picking up when there is some certainties in the market or at least when these unsold units are uh, beginning to come down to a reasonable level. Okay, I have a question about cooling measures. So what happens if the cooling measures continue uh, continue to sustain or the government uh, or the government is not going to leave this leave the existing cooling measures? Will the demand of the property continue to fall? Okay, uh, at least at this point of time, even with the cooling measures in place, you can see that sales are actually still coming in, i.e. gradually. So as long as there is some uh, uh, if as long as like what we just mentioned just now about the where we show a chart about the number of units sold versus the FTSE real estate index, you can clearly see that as long as units move, share price performance of the um, of a developer share price versus the number of units sold, um, that there is some that there there is a positive relationship to it. 
And having said that, as long as units can can move, even at this point of time, you see, I mean, for the past past two years, or uh, so between 2014 to the first half of 2016, transactions have been staying horizontal, and likewise, so has share price been staying constant. Uh, if there are no further questions, we will end the webinar right here. And thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Sure.